and welcome to this week's edition of the National Hour. I'm Jeff Hammersley. Alongside me, President-elect of Scarlet Gray Sports Radio, the one and only Brandon Beam, and his roommate and also Ohio State football player, this star, Mike Bennett. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. All right. Now, this is going to be a little interview segment of the show. Question numero uno. Question one. Question made by our good friend Hayden Grove here. Ohio State's recently hired Larry Johnson Sr. from Penn State to be your defensive line coach. What are you expecting from him, and what are you looking forward to most about working with him? Uh, I've heard a lot about Coach Johnson and how he's a big technique guy. He's a big uh, players coach, so he's not gonna, he's not really a guy who's going to try to um, embarrass you or do anything like that. He's going to get on you, but he's really just trying to look out for you and hope that at the end of practice you're satisfied with the way he coached and that he's satisfied with the way you practice. So I'm really expecting him to just be a technician and just make sure everyone on the D-line's a technician and he's going to get after us and push us just like Coach Vrabel did. And to speculate on your teammates, Mike, I know you can only speak for yourself, but how are guys like Noah, Noah Spence and Joey Bosa looking forward to going, playing for Coach Johnson as well? Uh, I think they're really excited. I know especially Noah and Tommy because they were committed to Penn State and they said it, the biggest reason was Coach Johnson. Um, he's said to be one of the best recruiters, especially at Penn State, so we're expecting the same from him here. But I think all the guys are really excited. He's got a big, a really big uh, repertoire um, bringing it in, and like everybody just knows what he can bring to the table. So I think everyone's pretty excited to see how the season goes. Exactly. Next season's football schedule looks a little different uh, than normal playing Maryland, Navy, and Virginia Tech, all making an appearance on the schedule. Uh, what are you looking forward to most about competing against these new teams? Um, I think that it's really good that Navy is our first team because uh, Navy requires a lot of uh, discipline to play them on defense. So I think that's going to be really good for us, especially as a team bouncing off of uh, having a less than disciplined uh, defense later in the season. I think it'll be really important uh, for us to play Navy and then uh, Maryland and Virginia Tech. I just think they'll be good opponents. Uh, interesting to see how, how they'll be this year. Yeah, really, for Maryland, that's going to be their first Big Ten game, first real big game they play against Ohio State. Are you guys looking forward to that game, make a statement going on the road against a Maryland team that really they've been playing ACC guys since forever, and now their first real Big Ten opponent, Ohio State, probably could be a primetime game. How amped up are you guys five, six months before that game actually happens? You know, you don't want to try to get too amped up too early, but it'll be a good statement, statement game. Uh, obviously, every game is a statement game, but we'd probably want to go out there and welcome them to Big Ten football, show them how the Big Ten does it. And it's important because they're going to come away from that game with a reflection of Big Ten football. So if we don't play well, they'll see the Big Ten as a reflection of, oh, this might not be that hard of a conference. If we play really well, then they'll realize that they're in a hard conference and they're going to have to work and get better every year. Okay, last year was a bit of a breakout season for you on the, on the, on the defensive line. Are you placing more pressure on yourself to perform this year? And what are you focusing on in terms of this upcoming season? Being a senior, uh, I'm going to put more pressure on myself because I, I have to perform. And like you said, I had a breakout season last year, but uh, there were a lot of things that I could work on, a lot of things I could get better at. And that's going to be my biggest thing in this offseason is making sure that I get better so that other guys will see that and try to get better as well. And I can push other guys just by what I'm doing. Uh, the D-line is young, which is great because we had such a great season last year. Um, it's, a, it's important for us to grow and not just – be okay with how we did last year. We need to, we need to get better technique-wise. We have a lot of guys who are physically just monsters but uh, struggle with technique sometimes, and especially with Coach Johnson coming in, I think this will be a really, really good year for the D-line and the Bullets in general. Speaking back to last season, Mike, uh, did you have any plays or any moments in any game uh, that were one, one or two of your favorites of the season? Well, as an interior D-lineman, every sack is a, is a favorite moment. So... <laughs> Um, I would say, let me think here. I would say that uh, there were a couple. My Wisconsin strip sack was really exciting, and then uh, a the strip sack and fumble recovery in San Diego State was probably was pretty exciting. Um, but just, I actually thought the game against the team up north, where Tyvis got that interception to win the game, was one of my favorite moments of the season. And there were others like that, uh, but I'd say pick any of the sacks that I had this season, and I was my favorite defensive moment for myself. One of my personal favorites was, I believe, during the Indiana game, you sacked the quarterback. And you did, like, the Borat thing. Yeah. Remember? I saw that. I forgot all about Cause that. Because it was, it was you. Because <laughs> it was Jimmy Bloomfield. It was you. We saw that. And we're like, 
what was that? Then you, you of course knew. But I thought I snapped the picture photos of that. I'm just like, this is amazing. The best the, part about it is like, it's like, all right, Mike, if you get a sack during this game, <laughs> do the dance. And so I mean, you know, right on point, gets a sack. Does the Borat dance, and I remember Jimmy and I are on, we're on the air on Scarlet and Gray Sports Radio, and we're both going nuts uh, when he did it, so it was... I didn't even know I was going to get the opportunity, but as soon as I got the sack, I was like, I got to do it. The ref interrupted watching. it a little bit. The ref looked like he was trying to stop it. He didn't, he must not be a Borat fan or something. He must not be, but it was, it was pure. It was great. Because <laughs> when that was Classic. passing, I'm sitting there like, I know it has to be for a movie, but... What was that hand motion you just made? I'm like... I got a lot of tweets I'm, I'm questioning. They're like, great sack, but I don't know about that dance. <laughs> I like it. It was a great sack nonetheless. Next question. With the loss of Ryan Chasier and Bradley Roby, as well as your, the former position coach, Mike Vrabel, what is going to be the biggest adjustment for the defensive line and the defense as a whole going into next season? I don't, I don't know how much of an adjustment it'll be. Um, I think we have a lot of playmakers, especially... Uh, you could see them come out on the D-line, but we have a lot of playmakers in the back end and in the linebacker core where they're growing up, they're getting older, they're starting to understand stuff better. And we're going to try to bring it back as a whole defense this year instead of D-line linebackers, DBs. We want it to be the silver bullets again. So I think the biggest adjustment will just try to be keeping everyone together and not breaking it up into individual units too much. But we have, especially with, like you guys said, Coach Johnson, Coach Rabel's gone. So Coach Johnson, he's he's – going to do a great job here. It's not a question of if he's going to be a right fit at Ohio State. He will be, uh, and he is. So he's going to be make sure the D-line is ready, and then the other position coaches are going to make sure their position's ready. And then as a defense, we need to have the, t- the guys on the defense come together and just play together and not point any fingers when something goes wrong. Uh, I remember near the end of the season, a lot of people were trying to point fingers at the secondary, but as a D-line, you have to get to the quarterback when they give you three seconds or four seconds. So uh, you can't really point fingers at any specific group or any specific person. It's a defense. It's 11 guys on the field, and everyone's responsible for doing their job. Going into this season, Mike, you're obviously one of the leaders on the defense. What kind of specific traits do you want to instill around the young guys on the defense around you? Uh, our biggest mantra this year so far has been we want our best players to be our best workers. And some of the young guys are our best players, like Joey Bosa, for instance. And he's a hard worker, too, so we want to make sure that other young guys see that the best players are the ones that work the hardest. Instead of sometimes guys, they'll be our best players, really athletic, but then young guys will see them not working hard or skipping workouts or something like that, and that can't be acceptable this year. And as a, I, figure, I feel that I'm a leader on the defense. As a leader, I have to make sure that the guys see me working hard and that I don't accept other older guys or younger guys not giving their best effort because then you start – when start, stuff starts going bad, you start looking at, well, this guy didn't work hard that one time, and it just starts breaking people up. That, that sort of leads on to the next question. Is that one of the big reasons why you stayed for a senior season at Ohio, for, at Ohio State to help learn the – help tutor the younger ones, or is it, just for, or is it for a different reason? There were, there were a couple of reasons I decided to stay. First, first off, probably the biggest reason uh, was after that Michigan State game, I knew I was going to stay because I'm – we had gone 24-0, uh, and that just did not like it. Did not like it at all, and I knew we play Michigan State next year, and that is going to be a big game for me personally. So that was a huge reason for me to stay was losing that game. And then obviously losing the bowl game gives you just another reason. And then I I talked to Coach Vrabel and asked for his opinion because I had been getting opinions from all different directions about you should go, you'd go second round or whatever they were saying. And he said – that he thinks it's better to just finish your college career, get that degree, and just get better. Become a better technician, get a little bit bigger, get a little stronger, know the game a little better. And the guy's been in the league for, or had been in the league for a while, so I really respected what he had to say and uh, took that advice to heart. All right, then that will wrap up the interview with Mike Bennett. We will take a short break and come back with some more sports here on the National Hour. And welcome back to the National Hour. I'm Jeff Hammersy, alongside me, Brandon Beam, and once again, Mike Bennett. He's going to stay with us for a little bit longer. Off to college basketball now, and the big headline, should we sound the alarm? Buckeyes drop games at Minnesota and against Nebraska. Guys, Minnesota was the first of two matchups with the Buckeyes this past week, January 16, 2014. Buckeyes were ranked 11th at that time. 
but they lose 53 to 63 to Minnesota at the arena called the Williams Arena, also known as the Barn. The big thing was it was 29-29 at halftime, and then the Buckeyes were outscored 34-24 the second half. Guys, what went wrong? What went wrong in that game for the Buckeyes? Well, I think one thing that Ohio State needs to look at is their offense right now. They just really cannot get anything going. Aaron Kraft and Shannon Scott. Uh, they have been non-productive at all. Going back to the Iowa game, uh, when Scott and Kraft were on the floor, their point margin together was negative 19. Uh, so you can never have that with your backcourt, uh, with one and two guys like that. Um, but then looking at the defense, I mean, defensively, this has been a shell of an Ohio State team uh, before allowing 63 points to Minnesota. And then against Nebraska the other day, putting up 68 points. I mean, this is a Nebraska team that's not good at all. They were the basement of the Big Ten, uh, and they come in and they beat Ohio State uh, so I really think that Coach Stadmata really needs to look in uh, to himself. They don't have that star role anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the Deshaun Thomas, the Jared Sullingers that they've had before. You know, everybody is a role player on this team, uh, and they need to get something figured out before the Big Ten uh, season you know, really takes its toll on these Buckeyes. But as for now, I don't think it's panic time just yet uh, because this Ohio State team is still going to get into the tournament because we did know they did rattle off 14 or 15 in a row, uh, and they can win games. But... Uh, they need to look at something inside, definitely. You know, Brandon and I had talked about it before, and uh, I feel that uh, Loving really needs to get more of a role on the offense. He seems to be a pretty good playmaker for the uh, Ohio State, and I think it's pretty important to get him more experience and just see what he can do, especially in the Big Ten. Uh, so by the time that the tournament rolls around, he, he becomes more productive. And another thing was I feel I, it's hard for me to put this much pressure on Amir, but it seems that when he has a good game, the Buckeyes win. When he does not have a good game, whether that's offensively or defensively, the Buckeyes struggle. And it's very clear, it's very clear when I think Nebraska had a t like 20 out of their 27 points were in the paint. Yeah, uh, at one point they on. had 20, 22 points out of 28 yeah. in, the, in the paint. So, yeah, and uh, that, was, that was very showing that Amir was not quite holding it down in the paint like he should be. And it's once he starts doing that and becoming more consistent, because he's had great games this year. He really has. He's come along. But he just needs to become more consistent. I don't think 0-4 uh, so far is a reason to panic yet. It's still early in the regular season. Uh, they'll be okay. Yeah, going back to that point, with, looking at the Minnesota game in the stat box, I mean, Elliot Eliason for Minnesota, 13 rebounds. 11 of those were defensive rebounds. Andre Hollins had six rebounds, five of those defensively. But we'll also look at the stat numbers. Eli Elliot Elias in 12 points, Andre Hollins 10 points, DeAndre Matthew from Minnesota 13. Three Minnesota guys were able to score in double figures in that game against the Buckeyes. It, it, un understandably, LaQuinn Ross shot 22 points, kept them close, but you can't give a team like Minnesota three guys to score in double figures. Though. No, no you, you really can't. Minnesota's a good team, and their home field, or I would say home court, is one of the best in the Big Ten, if not the country. The barn... Uh, is no easy place to go and play. And Ohio State knows this. I mean, they've lost to Minnesota before at the barn, so uh, they didn't really have any expectations going in that this wasn't going to be a tough game. I mean, they just got outplayed, and sometimes it just comes down to that. Uh, it really looked like Minnesota early on was driving to the lane, Amir Williams was being lazy. He wasn't crashing to the other side. And really, that's what caused Ohio State's problems was, I mean, Minnesota early on got points in the paint, and then that was their undoing again against Nebraska. So something has to go with this interior defense and we talk about Ohio State as one of the best perimeter defenders in the country uh, or defending teams in the country. And it just seems that almost everything for this Ohio State Buckeye defense has fallen apart and they're searching for an identity right now. In the past couple of years, I haven't noticed that Ohio State has been stellar on offense. So last year they had Deshaun and he would help them out on offense a lot. He would be able to draw double teams and make plays when they needed them. But at the same time, last year what got them so far was their defense, I felt. This year, it started off well. I felt that Aaron Kraft was, was leading the defense, hustling, doing Aaron Kraft stuff. But their offense, their non-productivity on the offense was really starting to kill them. And then in these last couple of games, I've seen the same non-productivity along with not quite as much heart on the defense. And that's not, I've, I'm not in the locker room. I have no clue what uh, could be going on inside. But they just need to get back to playing Ohio State defense. And that creates fast breaks and more opportunities, just get momentum on their side. Uh, Sam Thompson flying through the air creates more opportunities. It's just they need to get the defense back, and then I think the offense will follow enough to get them uh, back on the right track. Absolutely. I mean, 
when you look at the offense, and if you start to get the offense going, and then you know, then it kind of becomes an AAU NBA type of game. Mm-hmm. But if you start on the defensive end and you force defensive shutdowns, that's when you get back to Buckeye basketball. That's what it is. You force turnovers. You're nitty and gritty down on the post. You know, you are just mean down there. You don't let anybody get an easy shot, and that's what Ohio State <clears throat> has fallen away from. Uh, and it's really caused problems. But like you said, Mike, if you start to get your defense going, that is going to be, co- you know, that is going to force transition buckets for you and easy opportunities for scoring as where, you know, you let people score and then you let the teams get back on defense. So, right. Then it lets, you know, Ohio State has to set up their half-court offense, and we know their half-court offense is by far not the best in the country. Here's the problem from the two games. Minnesota shot 51.1%, 24-47 from the field. Nebraska, 23-46%. 50% from the field. And the Buckeyes, when they were shooting, 35.3% against Minnesota, 396 against Nebraska. That is so unlike Ohio State right there. And also looking at Aaron Kraft's numbers, Kraft had 12 points against Nebraska, four turn- turnovers, however. And then against Minnesota, held to seven points with five turnovers. Those are two things that we, if you would have told me last year what have happened to this Buckeye team this year, I would have said that's absolutely preposterous. This Buckeye team can't be this bad, but they actually are. They can't, opposing teams shooting over 50%, that's mind-boggling, especially against teams against Minnesota and Nebraska. Yeah, I mean, you look at Minnesota, and one of the mid-runners in the Big Ten, they're not going to be up there with the Michigan States, the Ohio State, Michigans, Indianas, that like that, but they're middle of the pack. They're going to be in the tournament more than not. That's just the way Minnesota is. They're kind of an anomaly on themselves. But Nebraska, I mean, the Nebraska game, I think, was a lot worse than Minnesota. You go into the barn and you think, okay, we can get a win, but it's going to be tough. Uh, this is an Ohio State team who beat Nebraska by a solid amount earlier on this year. 32, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. It was in the 30s. Yeah, so a 30-point 30 30 point win. Uh, and then you go to Nebraska, which isn't really known for their home court. I, I don't know. It, it's something to say, something to scratch your head with because usually a Thad Monica coach team is very disciplined uh, and – Right now, it's just seeing everything is going wrong for this team. I mean, they're not hitting jump shots. Aaron Kraft is driving the baseline, and when he does that, he forces himself way more trouble than he does good because he goes baseline, and then he tries to kick the ball out, and I haven't seen him complete a pass off of that yet this year. It always goes sailing out of bounds. Uh, and then it, they become so predictable. They mm-hmm. really, really have. When Aaron, Scott, or, excuse me, Aaron Kraft gets that look in his eye, you know, when he goes to drive, I mean, more than time – He's not going to kick. He's going to hold the ball like this, and he's going to try and force a shot up. Uh, and it's so predictable. And if us sitting on our couches at home and watching this can see that, then absolutely a college basketball coach is going to see that. And they've also struggled against the 2-3 zone. Iowa is the first one uh, that really showed that. They implemented the 2-3 zone, then Iowa came back and won that basketball game. But even in the Minnesota and Nebraska games, they implemented that, and all of a sudden the Buckeyes' offense becomes stagnant. Nope, everybody stays in their one spot, and they just keep playing ISO motion basketball. And you cannot do that in the Big Ten, even against a team like Nebraska. When you start seeing such low uh, percentages in shooting, you start wondering what kind of quality of shots they're taking. And I think that they're starting to force shots because they, can't, they don't have a very good uh, half-court offense. And you're, they're not getting it to the uh, early Nebraska game. I saw that they couldn't get it down into the paint. They were forced – forcing perimeter shots when they weren't even very really open. I'd say Amadeo and uh, Mark Loving are probably the best uh, perimeter shooters, and Amadeo's not in that often. And then Loving's a freshman, and he's not in that often. So you've got Aaron Kraft getting five seconds left on the clock, thinking that he, he needs to drive, and when he drives, he's not looking to make a layup. He's looking to get fouled. And teams watch film. They understand that he's driving to get fouled, so they play for it. And he hasn't been get, drawing as many fouls as he used to, and he's not been making the layups like usual, so it just turns into a turnover. Right. So it's just they need to get, make better shots. They need to move the ball and start penetrating into the paint so that they can kick it out to guys like Amadeo who can drain the threes pretty continuously. Looking at Minnesota and Nebraska upset Ohio State. Transitioning, but we're going to keep it in the Big Ten. Look at Indiana right now. They beat Wisconsin, <clears throat> lose to Northwestern that game. But going back to the Wisconsin-Indiana game from last week, Wisconsin had to lead at the break. Comiskey, Decker, Bruce, Gasser, and Jackson, all Wisconsin starting five guys, scored double figures, yet they still lose that game. I mean, if you're Wisconsin, I mean, it's – Indiana, granted, it's an Indiana team, but still, when all, your, all your five guys are doing so well shooting, how do you lose that game on the road? Uh, I, I think you go into Northwestern and – uh, it's one of the places in college basketball which is very weird. I think they've got a different lighting system there where their shooters 
shoot a phenomenal percentage in their own home building. It's, you know, the engineers at Northwestern have done something there to give themselves a home field advantage. Um, but looking at Indiana, uh, if you look going into this year, I mean, they've got, of course, Farrell and they've got Sheehy coming back. But most of their team did not return. I mean, you have Watford who didn't come back. Jordan Halls, who didn't come back. I mean, Zeller and Old Depot, yep. two of those guys. I mean, that's losing basically your starting rotation. Uh, and Noah Vonley has given them something to really bounce off of this year and given them a chance in games. But without him uh, and without Farrell, I mean, that Indiana team is back to where uh, they started at a couple of years ago when Tom Crean came and took over that organization. But, I mean, then going in and beating Wisconsin at their home, at their home court, I think it's different. And, Mike, maybe you can talk about this a little bit. But playing number three Wisconsin – at home against going to Northwestern in a midweek Big Ten trip. It's, is it hard to get up for every game? It, I, there are a lot of games in the season, and that goes tenfold for basketball. There are a ton of games in the season. So when you have that spotlight on you, guys come to uh, Big Ten teams, Division One teams that play basketball, because they love the spotlight. They love performing in those big-time games. So it's much easier to get up for a Wisconsin, who's number three in the country, on a big-time uh, stage than it is for, like you said, a midweek Northwestern. Like, they're obviously still going to be ready for the Northwestern game, but it's not the same kind of energy, the same kind of drive where all eyes are on you. Uh, one last question before we go to the break. Is the Big Ten as good as it was last year, or has there been less of a gap between the top teams in the conference? I think it's definitely as good as last year. You look top to bottom. I mean, it's proven this week. I mean, Nebraska can beat Ohio State. Uh, and then Northwestern can beat Indiana. So just top to bottom looking at it, I mean, any team can beat anybody on any given night in the Big Ten. I think it's just as good as last year. Uh, there's, I believe, four or, four or five teams in the top 25 right now for the Big Ten. Uh, so absolutely, I think the Big Ten is still just it's the best conference. That's the great thing about college athletics is it doesn't matter uh, what your team's like. you got to come to play every night. Uh, and like Brandon said, you saw a lot, of, a lot of motion in the Big Ten this past week, and that just goes to show that it's not a given. Not every game is given just because you're ranked higher. You have to come to play against every Big Ten opponent, just like probably most other teams in the country, but you have to come to play in the Big Ten or else you're going to get dethroned. All right, that will do it for our college basketball segment of the National. We'll take a short break and come back with NFL playoffs. And welcome back to the National Hour. I'm Brandon Beam alongside Jeffrey Hammersley and Mike Bennett. Uh, heading into the NFL, last week was championship week inside the NFL. The first game we had on our slate was the Denver Broncos taking on the New England Patriots. Uh, and in that game, guys, Denver was able to win that game 26-16 over the New England Patriots. Uh, I thought that was a huge victory. I don't know if it was necessarily surprising uh, completely to everybody. I thought Tom Brady would be a little bit more productive than he was, um, but everyone knew Manning was, was going to have a field day with New England's defense unless they made some major changes, and he did. And his O-line, I felt, did a great job of protecting him all game. I don't, know if he got, I don't think he got sacked a single time, and that just let him make all of his audibles, not have to worry about who's coming and uh, who's blitzing and doing what. He would just pick apart New England's defense like clockwork. They had to kick a punt their first possession, and from then on out, it was points every single time. It's going back to the point you said, Mike. I mean, Manning wasn't sacked last week against San Diego. Again, wasn't sacked against the New England Patriots. But the bigger thing was the Broncos at one point were up 23-3 to against the Patriots. I mean, that I thought both these games were, were going to be close. I didn't even expect this game to be such a blowout at that point in time with the Broncos. Really, 23-3, you expect that maybe regular season game, but not in an AFC championship game between Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. I don't know. I think I kind of expected it going in. I thought Denver was going to walk all over uh, the Patriots, really, because New England is banged up on defense. They're banged up on offense. This is kind of a roster that Belichick threw together at the last second. Uh, and the fact that they were even in the AFC Championship game uh, was pretty crazy that they have gotten this far and they dominated the way they did. Uh, what got New England to the place that they did uh, was LeGarrette Blount in that New England mm -hmm. running game. Uh, when, D when Denver shut that down, on defense, Tom Brady had to go into panic mode, and he doesn't have the receivers. I mean, plain and simple, just yeah. doesn't have the receivers uh, to make a Super Bowl winning run, and it showed. It really did. As like you said, Jeff, Denver was up 23 to three at one point, uh, and Peyton Manning was just a surgeon out there. Just made some incredible plays, some incredible checks, put the ball exactly where they needed it to be, uh, and Peyton Manning came out victorious over Tom Brady and the. 
Brady versus Manning game. Everybody knows my opinion on that. Um, but yeah, Tom Brady uh, not going to the Super Bowl. Peyton Manning is for the second time in his career, and they're looking to get it done next or in two weeks against the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, but going back to Peyton Manning's numbers, 400 passing yards in that game. It really, he's the first quarterback since I believe Kurt Warner to quarterback two teams into the Super Bowl. He had the Colts. We took took on the Bears and took on the Saints, and then this time around he has the Broncos taken up against the Seahawks there. But either way, the legacy for Peyton Manning, I, I don't think what happens in this game. The fact that you can you can take go to the Super Bowl three times, two different teams, and have just so much unbelievable passing games year in year out. I think it's 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 really I'm speechless right now. But it's like it's extraordinary for that guy for a guy like Peyton Manning after the surgery to still be just as good as he was beforehand. I think a big part of that is he's finally got a team of weapons. Yeah. Um, at the Colts, he didn't always have a complete team. And you see he had three receivers with over 70 yards re receiving. And I think that's huge that he's got receivers that can play, an O-line that protects him, and then a defense that just trounces people. It's huge that he gets the ball back so often with that defense that the more you give Peyton Manning the ball, the more he's going to score. He gets – the more he's on the field – he sees the other team's defense, he dissects it, and he just scores. That's what he does. And now that he has uh, Noshawn Moreno, who's able to just rush all over people with such a great O-line, I mean, he's, he's got the weapons, and people have to worry about more than just him now. Yeah, you know, you look back to Indy, people are like, all right, Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne. That was pretty much yep. it. And then yep. Edger and James are only around in their career. Dwight I mean, now, yeah, Dwight Freeney on the defensive side. But now looking at Denver's offense, I mean, you've got Thomas, you've got – uh, Decker, and you've got both Thomases, I guess I should say. <laughs> then you've got Wes Welker out there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have Moreno and Ball and those guys in the backfield. Then the offensive line. I mean, like you said, Mike, this is an offense full of weapons, uh, and they are using it. And the defense is no slouch either. Uh, they held New, or excuse me, New England to 64 yards rushing this past weekend, which is incredible considering LeGarrette Blunt scored four mm -hmm. touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken, in the last game in the divisional round. So a defense that can get after it, also with a very potent offense, I mean, that is definitely cause uh, for some trouble if you're an opposing team. Uh, but switching a little bit of gears here, Tom Brady, 24 for 38, 277 yards, a touchdown. Uh, all right, guys, Tom Brady, fun fact, started his playoff career 10-0 and and now is since 8-8. Eight and eight. Has Tom Brady lost a little bit of his magic? I don't know if he has. I don't think he has. Uh... I really like Tom Brady and, and how he goes about the game. I think he's a real leader uh, for New England. And I think that he, I don't know if he's not being consistent. I think teams are getting better around him and they're getting better at playing against Tom Brady. Um, obviously 10-0 and 0 is a, plenty of time to get used to Tom Brady, but uh, I think people are starting to understand how he plays and what to take away from him. And obviously he is getting a little bit older, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's lost a step in any way. I think maybe those first 10-0 playoff seasons had some really good teams around him. Um, and each year you have to rebuild your team and you have to make sure everyone is, you have to count for injuries that happen throughout the season and that uh, just, that's just part of the game. So I wouldn't go as far as to say Tom Brady has lost an edge. I think that he needs to keep great teams around him and then play consistently because he also, he could have down years. But this year I thought he was the Tom Brady that we know and love. I'm going to agree with you, Mike, I think, for Tom Brady. Beginning of the year, as you said, he had a supporting cast around him. That's how he can beat the Rams for Super Bowl. That's how he can beat the Carolina Panthers in those two games. But I think as you progressively got toward now, Peyton Manning started winning the big games. He beat, he's now beating Brady twice in championship games. And also for Brady, losing the ball to more and all these other games. I think the other guys just outgunned him for that one game. It just happens to be in the playoffs. So, I mean, you go 10-0, you're going to lose eventually. Except for Brady, he's now 8-8 eight eight now since having that magnificent streak in the beginning of his career. Mm -hmm. And having that streak, uh, Tom Brady's 4-6 and six in his last 10 playoff games. Uh, all their wins coming in New England. So Tom Brady in the last 10, 0-6 oh on the road. So, you know, Tom Brady, you can debate all you want if he is what he used to be with those two championship win rings uh, and all that. But Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, at least one of the best combos to ever go down in the history of pro football. There's no... Not even doubting uh, about that. But uh, let's talk about something else. The Wes Welker hit on Aqib Tlaib. Jeffrey, we'll let you describe it here. 
Um, but do you think it was a dirty hit? I think it was Tlaib was coming across the middle. Wes Welker is going toward Tlaib. Instead of trying to get open to get a pass, Welker just goes after Tlaib and hits him. Uh, the pass was still incomplete. I believe Thomas dropped the pass, but I think looking at it, from at least what I saw, it looked like Welker was aiming at him, and that caused Tlaib to go down. I mean, he, Bill Belichick's press conference, too, after, I believe, the day after the game, he calls Wes Welker the Broncos receiver. So it's like, you know, it's already frosty, that relationship. Now it's now icy after that play. Ex-teammates. Oh, absolutely. And I think for that situation, it's, it looked like it was deliberate and that Wes Welker knew exactly what he was doing. It wasn't just, oh, I ran into Tlaib. It was like, I'm aiming for Tlaib to try to take him out of the game. All right, and it's something you don't want to see at that, that big of a level. But this is all speculation. Wes Welker's obviously not going to come out and say it that he was aiming for Aqib Tlaib. But uh, regardless, uh, you can kind of speculate on whether it was dirty or not or intentional. Uh, but here, stat lines to end the game. Peyton Manning surpassed John Elway for the most yards in a playoff game. Uh, John Elway had, or excuse me, previously Elway had 385 yards in the 1989 AFC Championship game. And Peyton Manning is now going to be the third Super Bowl trying to win it with two teams. Kurt Warner, the last one to try and do it with Arizona. Uh, so, moving on to the next game on our slate, the one that started at 6.30, Seattle Seahawks and the 49ers. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was looking forward to this game the Fun most. Game. I mean, the, the teams have already played two times this year. It's hard to beat a team three times in one season, uh, which is what Seattle was trying to accomplish. And guys, about Seattle, their home field is one of the best in the league. Yeah, CenturyLink Stadium field. It used to be Quest Field back in the day, but it's that place, when that crowd gets pumped up, when that 12th band flag gets raised, all bets are off at what's going to happen. That place is going to get loud. And as we saw, it wasn't as loud as it's been in the past, but still it was a loud game nonetheless. Seahawk faithful came out to support their team. At that level of uh, play, at the end of, as they, once you get to the NFL, uh, communication is everything on the field. And when a crowd is able to, to break up that communication between an, a quarterback and his receivers or a quarterback and his offensive line, then that really changes the game. And as, especially as an elite quarterback, you have to be able to make audibles and checks and point out who is who. And if your O-line can't hear you, you see offsides penalties, you see guys going the wrong way, or you see them pick, not picking up blitzes as well. And I think that really factors into how the game is decided. And it was. Uh, you know, we saw a couple of false start penalties late on from San Francisco, which mm -hmm. may, have, may have caused them the game. A stat line from this, Seattle 58 plays, San Francisco 54. Uh, Russell Wilson, however, on the first play of the game, fumbled it. Alden Smith came uh, and batted the ball away and then recovered it as well. So a great play there to start the game. Uh, and from there on, it was like, hold your breath because you don't know what's going to happen. If that's going to happen on the first play of the game, then this game was going to be crazy. Uh, and it did prove to be that way. Seattle came back to win 23-17 to over the 49ers uh, to clinch a spot in the Super Bowl against the Denver Broncos. Uh, but Wilson in that game, uh, he did have a nice touchdown pass towards the end of the game. He was only 16 for 25, 215 yards through the air. Uh, but there were a couple times there he looked a little shaky and inconsistent. Yeah, the inconsistent on some of the, on some of the passes there. But really, a still a decent game. You're taking on a very good defense in that time, in that game. Conference championship on the line, trip to the Super Bowl. I mean, both quarterbacks at times look extremely shaky. I don't know if it was the crowd, the environment, or just being in that situation where if you can close out this deal, you're in the Super Bowl. But either way, Russell Wilson still a fantastic job, even though he fumbled in the first play. Touchdown, very respectable numbers against that San Francisco defense. Russell Wilson, I think he did a, a great job just being a quarterback. You know, he has the threat of running it as well. And, I, did not, I didn't see that from him uh, that night. While you saw Kaepernick taking off and making a lot of plays with his legs, Russell can run. He can. He can make people miss. He's fast. But he chose to stay in the pocket and to try to make plays happen with his arm. And I think that, that really paid off for him while near the end of the game, Kaepernick lost the game with his arm. Mm -hmm. And that, just, that shows the, a little bit of the difference between them. I think Russell's starting to become a true NFL quarterback who was able to be uh, very present in the pocket and just get comfortable with his offensive line. I also think that he's going to struggle a little bit against Denver, uh, which has a great pass rushing defensive line. And I did not see a Seahawks offensive line that looked like they were ready for that. Mm -hmm. San Francisco's defensive line really gave him some issues. Uh, and that'll be interesting to watch. It, well, I mean, San Francisco's D line is one of the best in the NFL. I mean, true. Uh, and not the you know, knock on anything on the Seahawks offensive line, but give me the 49ers defensive line over mostly any Seahawks or over any offensive line in the country. 
Um, but then just going over that, uh, Colin Kaepernick, uh, 14 for 24, 153 yards, a touchdown, 11 carries for 130 yards. Uh, in that game, but two crucial late interceptions by Kaepernick, Jeff, that really cost the 49ers a chance of going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I believe Cam Chancellor got one of them, about four or five minutes left. Then the last one, the tip drill from Sherman that led to the interception at the end with, with about, I want to say, like 30 seconds left in that game. But in the 49ers, they had chances. They could have easily won this game with a couple good drives, but Kaepernick, they got him that far, but then the two picks down the end, that, that doomed him. And in the playoffs, you can't be throwing interceptions this late in the game. Now, this, this might be taboo to talk about, but I felt that there were a couple questionable plays that really could have changed the tide of the game. One of them was that punt where they didn't call it. They called him hitting his uh, kicking leg rather than his plant leg. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't, that led to a Seahawks touchdown, so I'm not sure how that could have influenced the game. And the other was Navarro Bowman, uh, who tore his ACL, MCL, whatever CLs are in his knee, he <laughs> tore them. And on that play, he ripped the ball from uh, the receiver's hand and – Created, had a turnover. He was holding the ball on the ground, clear as day to anyone sitting on their couch watching the game. And they said it was non-reviewable. They missed that uh, call up. And that is, that's uh, hard, to, hard to speculate on what could have happened, especially since that also led mm -hmm. to a touchdown. Right. And then, you know, it was an NFL rule. Should, and the NFL rule was it was a non-reviewable play because something happened. I think with, if you have possession, then it can't be reviewed in the field of play. But if it was a touchdown, it could have mm -hmm. been reviewed. I'm not sure of the exact rules. So should the NFL change the rule to where all the plays are reviewable or alter the replays rules for the playoffs even? I, I believe that they should. I mean, there's no reason to have replay uh, if you aren't going to get them all right, if they're, mm -hmm. they have that rule. I mean, a game like that, Navarro Bowman gave his heart and his soul to his team, stripped out a ball, kept it uh, until Marshawn Lynch came and ripped it away at the end. Uh, he, you know, gave his knee ligaments out for it, had the ball, uh, and it was just really unfortunate. I mean, it didn't, didn't matter anyway. The Seahawks didn't score as they fumbled on the next play oh, right. on that fourth down. But still, it, it's, it, it was weird right. how they weren't able to review that play. Uh, but they should absolutely, right. I think they should change that rule. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Let's say the Seahawks score on that fourth down play. Now that game, that final possession means nothing. With the Sherman interception or the, or the tip that led to the interception, it would have been like, what, like a 10-plus point lead for the Seahawks at that point. I don't see why there, some plays are reviewable and some aren't. I mean, I thought the point replay, if it needs to be reviewed, review it. I don't, it's like certain circumstances. Well, if it's on the one, we can't. But if it's, the, if it's in the end zone, we can. That, to me, makes no sense. I think every play should be reviewable. Now, you should still get this, the coaches should get the same amount of challenge flags, I believe. But if the refs need to review it, especially in a time like this, you have to review that because a Super Bowl spot and a conference title is on the line in these kind of games. I'm right there with you guys. I don't understand why you wouldn't want to review a questionable call. It doesn't make sense where there's a rule that you have the review there just waiting for you to go over there and look at it. It's, it would make no sense to say, no, I can't do that because it was on the one-yard line instead of the goal, instead right. of the end zone. So uh, that seems like a ridiculous rule that not all plays would be reviewable. Maybe they're trying to cut down on time. I can't speculate as to what, the, what it would be because every single play matters, especially in a game like that, like the championship. And then uh, the play that really ended the game was Richard Sherman tipping the ball up uh, on Michael Crabtree, and then his player was, came over and intercepted the ball at the last seconds of that game. We all know Richard Sherman's comments that he made at the end of the game. Guys, quick wrap-up of that. Do you guys like the comments that Richard Sherman made? No. No, I don't. Um, I think it, maybe it's just being a, an old offensive lineman and a defensive lineman my whole life. I'm not used to that kind of an ego. Because uh, you don't usually find defensive linemen and offensive linemen who are going to talk like that and who will be that full of themselves. Um, he's, a great, he's a great corner. I don't know if I remember seeing him get caught on in that game. More power to you. Let your game talk. You don't need to talk. If you're that great of a corner, you don't need to talk. Uh, I also understand Crabtree was talking, <laughs> like most receivers and DBs do. But it's that much more embarrassing for him that you just knock the ball away on the last play to go to the Super Bowl than to go and look like an idiot in the camera, and now he looks justified for talking smack to mm -hmm. you. Just let your game play. People will respect you for that. People start looking down on you if you start just being too egotistical and too just hot-headed. It just doesn't make sense. It's not a good look. For me, at first, I didn't like it. Then I thought about it. I'm like, there has to be something to this. He went to Stanford. You got to have Compton with a four point, I believe 4.2 GPA out of high school to going to Stanford, so there's something there. I looked into him. He has T-shirts. He has all this other stuff. 
a stunt like this, I believe his Twitter followers went, went up by like 111%. So he's got more people <laughs> looking on him. But also, if he has that side business selling t-shirts and stuff with, like the, with his name and everything on it, he just generated more revenue right there. And also looking forward, you have probably Super Bowl media day, he's right, the media's going to be all over him now. It's, it's going to be against Peyton Manning, Wes Welker, maybe Russell Wilson, Carroll and company. But now Sherman, he's out in that conversation and in that whole media spectacle that will be the Super Bowl. And we all know that week leading up, that's going to be one of the main storylines is, is, is going to be Richard Sherman, what he said against the Niners and what he's going to do against the Broncos in the Super Bowl. All right, and speaking of final stories, Jeff, we'll just go ahead and hit on right into that, our final stories for the night. All right. College basketball, tis a silly place. So much drama has occurred this season, and conference plays only about six games deep. First, Ohio State has now dropped four games in a row, something that's unprecedented. Then you have a st North Carolina struggling, and the whole mess that is collectively in the Big Ten. Nebraska winning and losing close, Indiana beating Wisconsin and then losing to Northwestern, both at Assembly Hall, and then you get the anomaly that is Michigan basketball. If there's any indicator of what is to come, then we will, then we will have a fantastic rest of the season ahead of us. And even more importantly, an even more intense march. Can you imagine a world in professional basketball without team logos on the front of the jerseys? And not to mention the jerseys will no longer be showing off the guns of the NBA superstars, but instead those pipes will be covered up by sleeves? That's right, sleeves. The NBA is heading toward the sleeve, look, sleeve jersey look, and a lot of people are wondering why the world's premier basketball league is pushing sleeve jerseys on their players and on their fans. The majority of the responses have been overwhelmingly negative going toward the different look. Ever since the beginning of the game of basketball was always invented, they've been played with sleeveless jerseys. Matter of fact, the only, sleeves that are, the only leagues that have sleeve jerseys seem to be youth and recreation leagues, and now the NBA is forcing sleeve jerseys down the players' throats. It doesn't matter for big men and stretch forwards that don't shoot from beyond 10 feet. Other than that, the shooter's jerseys seem to be a little restrictive and can have some impact on the shot. The big question is why is the NBA doing this? It's simple. Money. The NBA is doing this so they can sell more jerseys and change the NBA culture. Down the line, there's a great chance that the NBA is going to implement the front of jersey sponsorships, just like the way professional club soccer has done around the world. The NBA is heading down the same exact path. Then the next five to ten years, we'll see sponsorships on the front of jerseys just so the NBA can add a couple more zeros to the end of their bank account. With blatant disrespect for their players and fan opinions, it will be definitely interesting how basketball community adapts to these changes being implemented by the NBA. And that does it for this week's edition of the National Hour. I'm Jeff Hammersley. Alongside me, Brandon Bean and Mike Bennett. Thank you for coming on the show, Mike. Pleasure. Uh, um, watch us on YouTube. Catch us on Facebook, Twitter, and watch us on Channel 19 on campus. That concludes this edition of the National Hour. We'll catch you next week.